In today's lecture, we're going to be carrying on with the theme of game ranch management, or game management, and specifically in today's lecture, we're going to talk about population regulation as it pertains to game animals. When we're talking about population regulation, we're really talking about three things, harvesting animals, translocating animals, and manipulating the habitat to move animals around. So harvesting is the physical removal of animals, usually through something like hunting. Translocation is also the physical removal of animals, but this usually involves the moving of live animals, so that the animals are not killed. And then habitat manipulation is really just about pushing the animals around on your, on your particular uh, game farm or game reserve. So you don't actually remove any animals or decrease the population. Right, so when it comes to harvesting, this is what we are dealing with. We're dealing with animals that are usually killed, either for meat or for However, when we are talking about harvesting animals from a particular reserve, we need to make sure that we develop quotas for the removal, the number of animals that are removed that are sustainable. So if you have a quota that is not sustainable, your population will continue to decrease and you'll end up having the population going locally extinct. Now it's important that when we as game reserve or conservation managers set quotas that we incorporate the growth rates of the animals. So it's very important again to monitor your populations so that you know what the growth rates of those populations are so that you don't exceed these. And you must, very importantly, you must always harvest animals according to the, uh, the objectives of your particular reserve. Very importantly, when you're harvesting, either for meat or for trophies, you must not harvest during the breeding season so that you don't have a, an even further negative effect on the animals. When it comes to the techniques that are, are used for harvesting, you can use conventional hunting, so heading out with usually a high-powered rifle and shooting the animals. This normally happens during the day. However, if you are interested in utilizing the meat for sale uh, to other suppliers, it might be a good idea to shoot at night with a spotlight and often incorporating a silencer onto your rifle. The reason for this is that if you shoot an animal um, during the day, such as with conventional hunting, this can often cause the animals to run and that stresses the animals and that can then change the flavor and the taste of meat which might make it less palatable for consumers. So if you are hunting um, or harvesting for meat, it might be a good idea to do this, particularly for ungulates during the night. If you're just interested in removing large numbers of animals from your population, it might be a good idea, although it's expensive, to utilize hunting from a helicopter. This is not a good method when you are wanting to uh, hunt animals for meat because it, it includes a huge amount of stress and this is not very good for the sale of that meat after the hunting has taken place. Now harvesting frequency uh, you will often find when speaking to managers that they have particular um, frequencies that they like to utilize where in their experience it doesn't tend to negatively affect the populations that they are harvesting. However, this seems to vary quite a lot when it comes to different parts of the country and certainly different species. And so at the moment, we can't definitively say that you should harvest once, twice, three times a year or have a break of two, three years in between. It's very important as a manager that you recognize that this will be dependent on where your reserve is situated and also the objectives of your particular reserve and the species that you're dealing with. Right, so now to the big question of contraception. Now, 
what we're going to do in this section is we're going to talk about contraception as it pertains to some of the more high profile species that you can find um, on some of the reserves in South Africa. And these are species like elephants and then some of our larger predators. So these two species or groups have been chosen because these animals can have a disproportionate impact on either the vegetation in the case of elephants or on prey numbers when it comes to predators, things like lions and cheetahs and so on. So, in terms of elephants, what has been developed is something known as PZP, or porcine zona pellucida. This is something that was developed from um, pigs, hence the name porcine. And this is actually a vaccine that is administered to elephants up to three times, female elephants. And what it does is it causes an antibody response, as you can see in the image on the right-hand side here where it, it prevents fertilization. It forms a layer around the ovum, around the egg. And when, um, so there's a layer of, of organic material around the egg. And when the sperm enters the reproductive tract, the sperm is effectively recognized as an antigen. And so the antibodies prevent fertilization. So there's a layer of this PZP that forms around the, the ovum and it prevents fertilization from occurring. So effectively, it's temporary uh, infertility in female elephants. Um, its massive advantages are that it is able to be administered from a dart, as you can see on the top left-hand side, by a vet. So it's able to be delivered remotely, as they say. And this allows you to administer, uh, it allows you to administer the um, contraception without having to uh, effectively put the animal to sleep or tranquilize, sedate the animal. Importantly, it is reversible, so you can reverse it after a certain amount of time, depending on the objectives of your reserve. Um, but there still needs to be some more research conducted on the behavioral and social responses or consequences of delivering this to elephants. As I'm sure you'll all know, elephants are a very um, very, very bright animals, and they also have a very um, rigid and complex social structure. And so more research is needed on what the behavioral and social effects will be with this being delivered to more and more female elephants around the country. Just as an example, if we take a population, this is actually a real population of elephants, in South Africa, uh, we have a graph of population size on the y-axis and time on the x-axis. And what we are doing here is we're having a look at what would happen to a particular um, elephant population if it stayed the same, so and nothing was done. And this is the top line over here. That population would continue to increase well past what is considered the ecological carrying capacity and then the economical carrying capacity. So this reserve needs some elephants in order to attract tourists. So that's the economical or, or economic carrying capacity. And this is the ecological carrying capacity. How many elephants the population can sustain. So if they don't implement any uh, contraception, the population just continues to increase rather, rather steeply. If they were to have three years of every three years, rotating their cows on the contraception. This is what it would look like, and they'd reach the ecological carrying capacity in around about 2021. But if they had all the females on a six-year cycle, they would then only reach carrying, ecological carrying capacity in 2025. Right, so when it comes to carnivores, here are some of the more charismatic species that we can be talking about. And when we, are on, when we are conservation managers of game reserves, we often ask ourselves the question, how many can we support? These are very charismatic species, and they're species that tourists want to see. So if you have a tourism destination or an ecotourism reserve, these are the species that you want to come and see. So we're actually looking more at not a minimum number, but a more of a maximum number that can be. So we, if we just have a look at some examples, this is some real example. This is a real example from um, a reserve in South Africa where we're having a look at 
the diet of the lion. So how many kills have the lions made and of what? So here are the species that they've eaten and how many of each of those species is on the y-axis. So it involves some intensive monitoring. You need to be adaptive with the time, uh, with the way that you manage them. And it needs to be embedded in a long-term approach. So the maximum population for, for lions that this reserve can support was, was calculated using some very important um, monitoring data where you can work out how much biomass in kilograms the lions should take off and um, what that means in terms of what's actually available and then what did the lions actually remove. So you can have a theoretical offtake, so how many should so many lions be eating and how much did they actually eat. And what this particular reserve found was that the prey that they, they prefer the most, uh, they increased by about 12% over this particular time period. And the, the, the reserve can support a population that removes 12% or less of the biomass. Okay, So again, you need to know the growth rates of the prey. So this reserve can support a lion population that removes less than 12%. So if they use this, this table over here, you would see that they can support probably in the order of four lions, four adult lions, and that's what this particular reserve uses as its target. So again, it's very important to highlight the importance of monitoring, especially when it comes to your higher profile species like predators. Right, so when we are looking at contraception in species like lions, um, this is this is a, a different approach to contraception. It's not an, uh, a vaccine type of approach. This is uh, an implant. It's called deslorelin or suplerin, and these these implants are actually gonadotrophic um, hormone suppressors. So what they do is they is they mimic the removal. It's not actually the removal, but it mimics the removal of the ovaries in females by suppressing sorry, the endocrine system. So it stops the estrus cycle from happening. Okay, So it is difficult, different from the way that PZP works for elephants because this is actually an endocrine blocker. It blocks the production or the, the ovulation of lions in particular and also other carnivores from happening. So there may well be social ramifications. These also need to be um, studied further, particularly in the form of prior fragmentation in lions. Um, but it is very difficult when it comes to predators to find places that will take lions that are not then sold into the bone trade, the lion bone trade, or sold to canned hunting. Um, but it can be extremely costly if you have too many lions. So they can remove a lot of prey um, and it might then become very, very difficult to, uh, to deal with that situation. So it can be very costly in the long run. So alternatives could be to mimic male takeovers. Um, so if you introduce new males into an area, the, the males, what lions do is they commit what is known as infanticide. So if a new lion comes in, he will actually kill all the cubs from the previous uh, lion's litters and that way you may well be able to keep your lion population down. But that is a, is a very difficult one to control. So all in all, it's very important to make sure that you keep the monitoring of your predators in tip-top shape. Other mechanisms or methods that can be used when it comes to, to um, essentially controlling your predators is to utilize what the Endangered Wildlife Trust has been doing when it comes to cheetahs. And these are not quite endangered, but these are um, vulnerable species. And what they do is they introduce them into new areas. So these are two cheetahs down in the bottom left that were sedated and then released into a brand new uh, part of the country where cheetahs hadn't been present for nearly 100 years. And the whole idea here is to move animals around, find new areas for them, and also to move them around to promote genetic mixing amongst the population. So rather than contracepting, you might want 
move animals around. But remembering that this is actually a very difficult, um, or I should say, this is actually an approach that is not going to be sustainable in the long term because ultimately you're going to run out of places for the animals to be placed. And there we have some beautiful pretty pictures of what cheetahs look like when they're young. And that's the real attraction for tourists.